You're listening to A Temple Wild, Episode 2, Daphne and Apollo. Welcome to A Temple Wild, where we rediscover the myths of the ancient Greeks through the plants and landscapes that shaped them. My name is Ecstasy, and it is a rather cold and rainy day here on the mountain where I live in northern Greece. And, you know, we often get these really strong storms that come down off the mountain um, with these incredible winds. And one of my favorite things to do during a storm like that is to sit in our kitchen and look out at our garden where we have this incredible bay tree, this bay laurel tree that grows against one of the walls in our garden. And I just love to watch it dancing and moving in these winds. And for those of you who've heard of the bay laurel tree, most of you just call it bay. Um, it's often used as a culinary herbs. You know, the, the leaves are, are added to soups and stews. Um, and people sometimes grow them in pots and kind of prune them into these interesting topiary shapes. Um, but in Greece, it, it does actually grow wild in ravines and in woodlands. Um, and it can grow quite quickly, especially when it's sheltered from strong winds. And it's beautiful. It's an absolutely beautiful plant, um, typically taking on more of like a shrubby shape. But like I said, you can prune it into into trees, um, into a more tree-like shape. And it's drought tolerant. It's aromatic. It has these really smooth, dark green leaves and white with yellow flowers that provide nectar for honeybees and bumblebees and solitary bees. And it is dioecious, which means that the male and female flowers are actually found on separate plants. So it's only the female trees that will produce purple-black berries. So if you've ever seen a bay tree and wondered, you know, why, why is this flowering, but I'm not seeing any berries on it, that's why it's probably, you've probably got yourself a male tree there, which is the tree that we have in our garden. We've got this incredible tree, like I said. Um, I'm guessing it's probably somewhere between 30 and 40 years old. It's absolutely spectacular. Um, but we do have another tree close by on our property that is female, and so that tree tends to um, produce berries later in the summertime, early fall. So the bay laurel is also called sweet laurel, or Grecian laurel, sweet bay, or like I said, just sometimes bay. And it does have a special relationship with the Pythia, who is the Oracle of Delphi, and of course, that Greek god that we all know, Apollo. It's an important tree for prophecy and for divination, and its leaves were burned and chewed to encourage visions. So perhaps the most well-known myth, though, of the bay laurel is that of Daphne and Apollo. And Daphne, whose name actually means bay laurel in Greek, um, her name was Daphne, and in modern Greek, when we talk about the bay tree or we talk about the bay leaves to be cooking with, with we do call it Daphne. Um, so it's her story that we're going to be talking about today. And, you know, she was a nymph in, um, in ancient Greece, but different stories kind of place her in different regions or in different areas. So in one story, she is the beautiful daughter of the river Pineos, which is a river in the Vale of Tempe, which is a gorge in the region of Thessaly between Mount Osa and Mount Olympus, or Mount Olympus, as, as you also say. Um, and in another version of her story, though, she is actually a nymph of the river Lavon, which is in the Peloponnese, which is in the southern area of Greece. Um, and yet in another story, she's actually connected with the sacred site of Delphi, which is on the southern slopes of Mount Parnassos, 
which is in the ancient region of Phokis, also known today as Phokiva, in Steria Alatha, so central Greece. Um, but if you want to hop over to a templewild.com, I do have a map there so you can kind of get a sense of where these, where these stories are placed, where Daphne um, is coming from. So in this last location, though, as a nymph of Parnassos, um, that's to me the most interesting connection because that links her quite intimately, as we'll see, with the Oracle of Delphi. So, like I said, we're going to be talking about her story today between Daphne and Apollo, and I hope that you enjoy. Daphne was a nymph, the beloved daughter of the river Pineos. Her only desire was to remain unmarried, content to freely wander the watery groves of her home with her fellow nymphs. Some say that her grove was near Delphi, a sacred site of that primordial earth goddess Gaia, the mother of sky, sea, and mountains. And Gaia's child, the great serpent Pitho, guarded the area. When the young god Apollo, the new son of Zeus, arrived at Delphi with a desire to craft himself a place of worship, Apollo killed Gaia's serpent, Pitho, and claimed Delphi as his own sacred center. Gaia, in grief and in rage, called upon Zeus to demand retribution for the death of her son. And in response, Apollo was ordered by his father to undertake a series of cleansing rituals, the first of which sent him down into the valley to cleanse himself in the river to atone for his transgression. But Apollo was proud after his victory over Pitho, and when he arrived at the river and came across Eros, that small cupid of desire, Apollo mocked Eros, saying that he should leave large weapons like the bow and arrow to greater gods like himself. As Apollo says in Ovid's Metamorphosis, What wanton boy are mighty arms to thee, great weapons suited to the needs of war? The bow is only for the use of those large deities of heaven whose strength may deal wounds mortal to the savage beasts of prey. But Apollo seemed to forget that even great gods as himself are not above the power of desire. So Eros responded to Apollo's hubris by sending a golden arrow of desire into Apollo's chest and at the same time, he sent a leaden arrow of repulsion into the chest of Daphne, the nymph, so that the moment that Apollo laid eyes upon her, he would desire her just as strongly as she would be repulsed by him. And indeed, when Apollo saw Daphne, he immediately wanted her. Pining and hungry, he sought her attention, but having already devoted herself to a chaste life of freedom and being further repulsed due to Eros's leaden arrow, Daphne was totally uninterested in Apollo's advances and she withdrew from him. Now another mortal, Lefkipos, also longed for Daphne and wanted to be by her side at all times. Knowing she had chosen to withdraw from the company of men, Lefkipos decided to disguise himself as a maiden so that he could join her retinue and get close to her. But Apollo discovered this, and in his jealousy that another man, mortal or not, should get so close to Daphne, Apollo encouraged her nymphs to bathe in the river, knowing that it would force Lefkipos to disrobe and reveal his secret. And upon discovering that he was in fact a man, Daphne and her nymphs killed him for his deceit. Apollo, satisfied that Lefkipos was now gone and out of the way, continued his relentless pursuit of Daphne. He followed and chased her along the river banks, praising her beauty and growing in his lust. The more she spurned him, the more he wanted her. And exhausted and terrified, Daphne finally called out in desperation for someone to protect her. In one version of the story, Gaia hears her call and opens the earth to swallow Daphne whole, placing a bay laurel tree where she once was. 
In another version, Daphne's own father, the river Pineos, transforms her into a bay laurel tree, metamorphosizing her so that she could forever remain chaste and rest peacefully beside the river. Apollo, saddened by the loss of Daphne, but still joyous from his defeat of Pitho, declared the bay laurel his emblem and sacred tree. He cut a branch from her body and wove himself a wreath of branches and returned to Delphi, crowned in self-proclaimed victory. He built his own temple, which according to Pausanias was first made entirely of bay laurel, and established the Pythian Games, a yearly festival and physical competition in honor of Pitho, that great serpent whom he'd slain and whose death had required Apollo to go down to the river to cleanse himself of his transgression, where he met Daphne and this whole story began. Because of this, the bay laurel became a symbol of ritual cleansing, but also of victory, first for the Greeks and then for the Romans and many paintings, coins, and amphorae depict the laurel wreath as a crown of triumph. During the Pythian games, especially, the victors were adorned with woven laurel wreaths, and even today, the Nobel Laureate and the Baccalaureate are awards of distinction. So once Apollo had taken over the sacred site of Delphi and established his center there, the oracle priestess of his temple came to be called the Pythia, named after Pitho, Gaia's great serpent who had once guarded the site. And it said that the Pythia, she would sit upon a tripod above a chasm in the earth and she would chew leaves from a bay laurel tree that was growing in the sanctuary of the temple. And she would also shake a sacred bay laurel branch, all while inhaling the geothermal fumes that were emitting from the ground beneath her. And while in her divine trance, she would utter prophecies, usually in the form of poetic riddles, which are very similar to koans, that would then be interpreted by the priests and the querents. And most of you probably already know that the Pythia, the Oracle of Delphi, held significant power and that many famous prophecies were uttered by her, including that of Oedipus, the outcome of the Persian War, countless others. And her wisdom was used to make political decisions. But before Apollo's temple was built, before the Pythia was established as a prophetess for the elite and the politically powerful, it's said that there were three oracular bee nymphs, called the Melissae, who lived in a cave on the slopes of Mount Parnassos, just above the sacred site of Delphi. And that it was those three Melissae who were responsible for teaching Apollo the art of divination. And, wouldn't you guess, that one of those three nymphs was named Daphne, the bay laurel. And in fact, Daphne was said to be the very first oracle of Gaia, at Delphi before Apollo's arrival, and that the Pythia's later use of the bay laurel in divination is very possibly a thread from those older, earlier practices. So as we can see, there's this very close connection between the oracular bee nymphs, the melissae of Parnassos, and also the bay laurel tree. And the Pythia was even later referred to as the Delphic bee, which I think is a nod to her origins as one of those original oracular melissae. And as I mentioned before, Pafsanias says that the very first temple in Delphi was crafted from bay laurel, but the second temple was made by bees and was composed of beeswax and feathers. And in our next podcast episode, we're going to be returning to the Melissae and talking a little bit more about the bee nymphs of Parnassos. But I find this connection really important and really interesting as it seems to strengthen the role of the bay laurel as an important tree for divination and for prophecy. So 
So the bay laurel is a sacred herb of oracles, and it's a potent source of prophetic clarity and wisdom. And woven into our daily ceremonies, it can be used for prophecy, divination, or cleansing. It lends its clarifying scent and its warming nature to the clearing of spaces and the inspiring of oracular visions. So regarding Bay Laurel's other association with victory or with triumph, Apollo's victory over Pitho and his chasing of Daphne, um, that story seems to me to indicate more of a cultural shift where the new god Apollo comes in and usurps the sort of older nature spirits of the mountain, being Gaia and the nymphs and Pitho, and he comes and he usurps them by force. And so for this reason, and also based on my own personal experience of actually working with the bay laurel tree itself, I've never really felt that victory or triumph were really key powers or messages of the tree. So instead, I personally choose to refer to its powers as a tree of prophecy and clarity, and to use that in guiding my daily ceremonies and interactions with the tree. Um, but of course, I encourage you to do your own connection and your own connecting with the bay laurel and to see what the tree has to say to you about its own nature. So I want to take a moment, though, to point out that the bay tree that I'm talking about here is the Loris nobilis, and that's the scientific, the botanical name for this tree. And it's important to note that because there are other trees that are also called bay or sweet bay, um, and those trees are actually poisonous, and um, they look very similar, but they have very different properties to the Loris nobilis. So it's really important to make sure that you're working with um, this specific bay laurel tree, the Loris nobilis, when you are doing anything like cooking with it or using it for any of your daily ceremonies. Um, so just always make sure that you're working with the right plant, um, you know, because some plants are toxic and can actually do damage to your body and in some cases even kill you. So um, not to get too serious for a second, but, um, you know, it's always really important to be careful when you're working with plants that you know exactly which plant you're working with. So dried Loris nobilis leaves, um, they're delicious. They're wonderful in stews and in soups and in casseroles. Um, you know, you can actually just add them directly right whole right into the cook pot. Um, usually at the end, after cooking with them, people remove the leaves before they serve the dish um, just because they can be quite tough to chew and they're not typically meant to be consumed um, and only used as flavoring, you know, if, if you're cooking with them. And the dried leaves in your pantry, they should retain a really dark green color. So most of the leaves that you buy at the grocery store, if they'll, they're pale or they're brown, that means that they've lost most of their potency and their flavor, and you should probably just add them to the compost pile rather than actually into your cook pot. So you want to look for those really dark green leaves. And you can use the leaves fresh as well. They have more of a delicate flavor um, and they're really great for sort of shorter cook times. So I use the dried leaves when I'm making, you know, a soup or a stew that's going to be cooking for a long time. Um, but I can, you know, use the fresh bay leaves if you want to do maybe like a slow warming dessert cream or a slow warming oil on the stove, um, you know, and, and you would use them the same way as the dried leaves. Just put them straight in, um, you know, sort of warm warm them up in whatever you're making and then remove them before you serve the dish. So the bay laurel has a very warming and slightly peppery taste. Um, and it's really wonderful for use during the cold winter months. So herbalists traditionally use it, um, you can drink it as a tea um, to help, uh, you know, with digestion or like I said, add it into soups and stews for the same purpose. Um, if you have a cold or a flu, the leaves can be used for steam inhalation just to sort of clear out the, sense, the, the sinuses. Um, you can use the essential oil in a chest rub for congestion. And the hydrosol and the essential oil combine really well with other herbs like eucalyptus or rosemary or sage um, or even citrus. And like I said, it has that sort of warm, slightly peppery undertone. So I personally love to use bay laurel in any ceremonies that I have for clarity or for prophecy. So the dried leaves, you can wrap them, wrap them into incense bundles. 
um, or you can even burn them one at a time and sort of waft the smoke around to purify the air and purify your mind. Um, you can use whole branches for ceremonial sweeping of your body and of the space, especially after illness or after prolonged periods of sort of physical or psycho-spiritual congestion. The woven wreaths can be worn as a crown over your third eye, and the incense from the dried leaves can be carefully inhaled to encourage divination, um, especially prophetic vision or speaking or singing. You can use the dried branches, which are you know still adorned with leaves, as a rattle um, for altering your consciousness or just accompanying any of your divinatory utterings or any songs that you, you like to sing during your ceremony. You can also use the dried or fresh leaves um, as a divinatory tool for the casting of lots. So you can write symbols or words onto the leaves and then cast them onto your altar or onto a divinatory cloth. Um, you can put them into a bag and very carefully after focusing on your question or your intention, you know, withdraw a leaf and interpret its symbol much like you would maybe with a tarot card or with runes. Um, and one, though, of my favorite practices is to just sit beneath the bay laurel tree and, you know, entering into a state of calmness. You can inquire about your desire or your question and then just sit there and listen. Listen to the rustling of the leaves, really feel the texture of the bark beneath your fingers and stay open to any kind of messages that might be shared directly from the tree itself. So as with most of the plants, I love to have or write a small little devotion that I like to read either before or during my cleansing ceremonies or if I'm working with bay laurel um, in divination. So whether you're sitting before your altar or before the living tree, you can run your hands over the leaves and inhale that clarifying scent and offer this up to the bay laurel tree. Sweet Vafni, sacred herb of the oracles, impart your clarity so that I may see divine wisdom and speak divine truth. So thank you so much for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really love to have you join our community. Um, I've actually just started a new Patreon page um, where people can sign up as a monthly patron. And with your support, I'm able to actually afford the tools and the time that it takes um, to write, record, edit, and publish these stories from the mythic Greek landscape. So if you're interested in becoming a monthly patron, um, please do head over to atemplewild.com where you can find out more about becoming a regular supporter of the show. And even if you're not able to financially support a Temple Wild as a patron right now, thank you so much for joining me today in celebrating the mythic Greek landscape. If you'd like to download a transcript of the episode, or if you want to leave a tip in our tip jar, um, or even just send me a personal message to say hi, I would love to hear from you. You can head on over to atemplewild.com. And I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will see you next time. <laughs>